F1 helping to shape the modern world? Um, that's a good question. And, uh, um, there's lots of different bits of technology that we can point to. I mean, carbon fibre is a, is a big thing that uh, we didn't invent in Form 1, but we pioneered the usage of it. And now you've got um, a lot of planes being made out of carbon fibre. And I think Form 1 helped to accelerate the usage of carbon fibre technologies and develop different technologies. So that for sure is an area where we help to accelerate the usage of, of carbon fibre. But I think a lot of what Formula One is able to do is to bring a very strong philosophy, a very um, aggressive attitude to a lot of areas. And where technologies, which have perhaps been a little bit slow in developing, are introduced into Formula One, we're so competitive, we, we accelerate them, we, make, we develop much more quickly than normally happens in, in industry. So um, the, the KERR system, the Kinetic Energy Recovery System we have this year, um, was progressing, but nothing like the rate is progressing now we're using in Formula 1. We've really accelerated the rate. So there's also bit, bits and pieces. Disc brakes were invented in, in motor racing and, and uh, other various technologies. But I think it's more about this acceleration of ideas that Formula 1 really has uh, an impact in, in modern life. Is F1 technology helping to improve road cars? Um, I think it is, and it, it is similar to the point I made previously, that um, the acceleration of, of uh, technologies, and um, if we take the um, kinetic energy recovery system I mentioned, that's now being used both in the race cars and in the road cars at Mercedes and Mercedes-Benz. So um, people like to have exciting cars, they like to have high performance cars, and through Formula One, we're putting back in, particularly into the high performance area, um, technologies that people can use. The SLS, which is a big performance sports car, we've just made uh, a completely electric version of that using the technology we use on the racing car. And it's a fantastic car. It's, uh, it's just as exciting as the, as the petrol version. And it's, um, it's putting you know, maintaining excitement but putting the efficiency that we need for the future uh, back into road cars. So I think there's lots of areas where Formula One does put directly back into road car technology. Do you think F1 cars will, in the future, be powered by anything other than petrol or diesel? Um, I think there's going to be a hybrid technology for sure. We already have it coming in, um, in uh, 2014. The ratio of the combustion engine and the uh, electric engine is changing. At the moment we have a relatively small electric motor and a big uh, combustion engine. In 2014 they're going to be more evenly split and because the engine is turbocharged in, in uh, 2014 we can use the turbocharger also to generate electricity to put into the storage system to put into the electric motor. So what we're going to be doing in 2014 is seeing the fastest lap we can do for a specific amount of fuel and really drive the efficiency of the, uh, of the vehicle. And um, so I think we're going to see hybrid technologies for sure uh, become a factor in the near future. I think in the long term one of the um, one of the really exciting things about Formula 1 is the noise. You know, when, you, when you're on the grid of a Formula 1 race and the start's happening, it, the noise is tremendous. It's just, it, it creates so much uh, excitement and passion. And we've got to be able to maintain that. Because if we had completely silent Formula 1 cars, I don't think it would be as much fun. So uh, we've got to find solutions which um, uh, help the technology but also maintain the sport, maintain the entertainment, maintain the enthusiasm. In motor racing and general transport, what do you think the next big development will be? Um, I think hybrid technologies um, are become, going to become more and more commonplace. It's, um, it's hard to see us moving away from fossil fuels completely, but what's, what's happened in the last five or ten years is efficiencies have become really important. So 
And this is, this is where um, Formula One is very relevant because we have extremely light cars. We're always trying to push the weight of the car down and we, we make the cars very aerodynamically efficient. Um, and that's exactly what will happen with, with road vehicles. The weight's going down, the aerodynamic efficiency is going up. To, make, uh, to get the most of, out of that little drop of fuel uh, is becoming the critical objective. And I think um, that's where it's, it's really opening up and developing. And those efficiencies um, are going to become the key to future transport. You use additive manufacturing to make parts. In the future, do you think this could become available to people at home with personal 3D printers? It could do. Um, I mean, the technology is becoming, the additive technology, what we've primarily used it for, and it, it's the early stages, was, uh, was model parts, because we make these wind tunnel models, which we, we put in the wind tunnel. Uh, blow air over them, measure the forces, and these are um, half-scale models, or slightly bigger. And um, additive manufacturing technology has been extremely valuable for making those model parts very quickly, where you have low volume, maybe one or two uh, parts quantity-wise, um, but you want a very rapid response. The part has been a little bit expensive to produce, but in the scheme of things, it's, uh, it's very, very valuable technology for us. And we're, um, we're finding the machine costs are coming down, the technology is advancing, and we're now starting to make parts which we actually use on the car. So structural parts as opposed to just model parts. So that technology is, is advancing rapidly. And um, I can foresee a time in the future where we'll be making, we'll be printing solid components. So, you know, we'll be... We'll be taking our computers and we'll decide that we want uh, some, uh, some small piece of furniture for the house and we'll, we'll make it ourselves on, a, on an additive manufacturing machine. Do you use computational fluid dynamics to help design the cars? Very much so, and uh, more and more. And I'd say uh, um, 10, 15 years ago, it, it was very, you know, the, the um, computing power you needed would have filled, you know, several of these rooms. So um, it uh, it wasn't it wasn't so viable as it is now. And now the computing power we need can all be you know, can be fitted into a small box. So and it's a lot cheaper. And you know, the computers we would have needed 10 or 15 years ago would have been tens of millions of pounds and now uh, the, the, the equipment we need uh, to carry out these computational fluid dynamic calculations um, are absolute fraction of that. So the whole thing has become um, much more economically viable and at the same time the technologies as always have moved forward rapidly. So I have to say, you know, if you asked me that question 10 or 15 years ago, would CFD ever replace the wind tunnel, I would have said no. But I'm not sure that's the case now. I think maybe in another 10 years we'll be doing a little bit of wind tunnel work, full size or model size, to verify the work we're doing with the computers. And it's definitely moving in that direction. And it's primarily the aerodynamics of the car, the way the air flows around the outside of the car, but we're also using it to design the engine now, so the way the fuel and the air mix in the engine and the way it goes in through the inlet and out through the exhaust. We're doing it to model how the way the, way the oil is distributed in the engine, and how the fuel is distributed in the fuel cell. So it really has become a, a very prominent technology and um, I think over the next few years it's something that become more and more important to us. We have a lot of people working on it now and um, it's very efficient technology in terms of return for investment. Are simulators going to become more important in driver and car preparation? I think it's uh, it's the same type of uh, it's, it's same it's analogous to what I've just described with CFD. I think that um, the efficiencies become so great in in working within a, the world of simulators or a virtual world. It's so efficient and so consistent and so effective that they are 
becoming more and more prominent. Um, you know, we're starting to use the simulators now to develop the driver's skills because it's, you know, a driver, you know, a footballer goes on the training field and he develops the skills. For a racing driver, he can only really develop those skills in a racing car, which is a very expensive and difficult uh, environment. Um, both time consuming, uh, very expensive, if the weather's no good, you can't do it. So we're looking at developing those skills now within the simulator because of the uh, efficiency involved. And also enables us to develop the uh, type of cars we have, how they handle, how they behave. And by having a driver in the middle of the, the simulation model, we have the one big variable. The one big variable that's very difficult for us to model is the driver and how he reacts and how he responds and how he behaves. And by sticking a driver in there and having all the inputs here and then measuring all the outputs, in a, in a simulator world is proven to be very effective and um, you know, if, you, if you fly an aircraft, if you go travel on an aircraft these days that pilot will have had hundreds if not thousands of hours of simulated um, training on the aircraft which he's flying and we're the same with racing cars now, we're working towards uh, that type of world so it become very important in the future. How has your background with slot car racing helped your motor racing career? Um, it kind of got me into it, and so I guess slot cars, uh, which was a passion of mine when, when I was your age, um, you know, I was building slot cars and racing them, and um, it got me involved in the engineering aspects of, of racing. Uh, and I found even then, I often enjoyed building and designing designing and building the slot cars is much fun, if not more fun, than actually racing them. And um, I used to build cars for other people to race because I enjoyed building them so much. So that's always carried through. And when I realized I was no good as a racing driver, then I was able to focus on my, uh, my engineering side. And I think, I think the slot cars, I don't know if I did the slot cars because I had that passion or the slot cars generated the passion, but definitely it, um, it was very important part of my, um, my development as an engineer. And, uh, but I think the thing that, that's always critical is, is to have something which you've got uh, a passion for, something you've got, that you find exciting, something you've got enthusiasm for, because then you do it without anyone telling you you have to do it. You do it because you enjoy doing it, because it's fun. And uh, so therefore, um, uh, it was very important to my, my career in motor racing. What skills will future F1 engineers need? Well, it, it's changed quite a lot in the time I've been involved in Formula 1 because when I went to work uh, for Frank Williams in the early days, certainly um, the second time Frank started the company and I went to work for him, there were 11 people there. So you know, we had to do everything. You know, we had to design the car, we had to make it. And so I was a mechanic, I drove the truck, I did everything. Um, now, the sport is much more complex. We have 500 people now uh, in the Formula 1 team. So what it means is that everyone is becoming more specialised in what they do. So there's fewer people who have a, a wide range of skills because what we need are people with um, intense skills and specialities in specific areas. So you know, we have people who just focus on the aerodynamics, people who just focus on the structures, people just focus on the mechanics and everyone is becoming more specialised and it's a shame in a way that we don't have um, people with more general knowledge but that is the way of motor racing in some ways the way of the world that everyone is becoming more and more sophisticated and specialised in what they do so the people we will, we, we will have in the future um, will be specialists in all these specific areas of aerodynamics um, materials structures, mechanics, um, and it just become more and more specialised. Do you think Mercedes AMG Patronus will win next year's F1 championships? It's my ambition, Marcus, to do that. It's, uh, and, and in my 30 odd years of motor racing, I've never, I've never gone into a season thinking I'm going to win this season. I've always gone into a season with the ambition to win, with the 
commitment and determination to win. But I've never, I can't honestly say I've ever believed uh, in a sense that we were going to win. Because that, I think, is a weakness. I think to go into something competitive sport thinking you're going to win uh, is a weakness. You should go in massively preparing everything you need to do. Um, but personally, I, I, I didn't go in um, to any race thinking, well, we're going to win this race. I go into every race thinking, well, we're in good shape, we've got an opportunity, we've got to get everything right, maybe. And that keeps you sharp, keeps you on top of it, keeps you um, looking out for the little problems that are around the corner. And um, the team's moving forward really well. We've made some uh, good progress, particularly in the last six months with the team. And um, I'm optimistic for the future, but when it will happen, I don't know. Thank you, Mr. Paul, for answering all my questions. Okay. Thank you, Marcus. Hope you found it interesting. <laughs>